today I want to talk, so the title changed a little bit from the, the bio because I was writing my research statement. I was thinking about this idea of, not just, it's more about really, what, what I'm going to talk about is the fact that we put a bunch of stuff about ourselves online and how we can use it to understand ourselves. It's not really a big data story. It's about a story, this is a story today about making meaning. And this is work that I've done with a lot of students at Cornell, a lot of undergrads, some grad students, a few other faculty members, right? So when I say I or we, right, remember there's like, you know, 38 people or whatever who sort of went into the, the making of this sausage I'm about to present. All right, so <clears throat> on to sausage. Uh, some of these people are sitting in this very room. All right, so uh, the, the, the initial story is about data online. This should be not surprising to you. We put pictures online. We have lots of pieces of our lives recorded in Facebook and email, in blogs and other discussion fora, right? Most of you probably do a good amount of this. Some of you probably don't for privacy reasons. That's okay too. But on balance, right, pieces of the record of our lives are showing up. And in most of these systems, right, the system is designed to privilege the now. Because in social media, what people want is to be aware of their friends, right? And because companies know know that if there's not fresh content, people tend not to come back. And so what they do is they take this old data and they kind of put it down on the screen and then you never see it again, right? You as the person who created the data and mostly your friends as people who interact with the data, never, never look at it again, right? Other people look at it, right? Companies look at it, right? Researchers look at it. And, and in fact, I've done a bunch of this kind of stuff, and I call this, this perspective data as a window, right? Where people from the outside, based on the traces of your activity online, or maybe your phone, or whatever else you're wearing that sort of tracks information about you, I can look through that and sort of get a picture of you, right? If I'm a system, right? So this one up on the left is a system I built back in the day called SuggestBot. SuggestBot looks at what you edited in Wikipedia um, to sort of get a idea of what you're interested in. It knows something about the Wikipedia community as well. It knows that there are certain kinds of work in Wikipedia. Wikipedia has articles that need expanded. They need to be put into a format that's more wiki-like. Links between articles in the encyclopedia need to be made. And it sort of takes its knowledge of you and its knowledge of the community's needs and puts them together to recommend items, recommend articles that you'd be interested in helping to edit, right? So the system, by being smarter about you, helps Wikipedia. Maybe helps you a little bit by making it easier for you to find something to do, but mostly the system is smart, right? Or over here, this is some work that was done by some colleagues at Cornell, uh, Michael Macy and Scott Golder. This is a picture of world happiness. What they did was they said, oh, people sort of express how they're feeling on Twitter a lot. Why don't we go collect half a billion tweets, segregate it by continent, that's what the four different colored regions are, do it by hour of the day because Scott's really interested in temporal rhythms and because temporal rhythms actually say something about our lives, right? They shape the ways that we, we feel, right? You know, the, the, that 12.30 at night studying thing is a lot different from like that 12.30 uh, uh, in the afternoon after lunch. I'm a little tired listening to a talk thing. And these things actually affect how we interact. And based on the fact that a lot of data is on Twitter, what they thought was, well, we can actually look at the world's mood, right? And so, you know, people get really kind of, you know, your negative feelings actually dip really low here early in the morning, which is weird, and positive feelings go way up, right? People are happiest for some definition of happy that involves what a computer can process by looking at the words in your tweet, right? And for some definition of the world, right, you'll notice that this red bar that represents the U.S. is very thin compared to this giant green bar that represents Africa because there's not nearly as many tweets there right now, right? And so we're getting these kind of biases samples of data, but we're still getting data that can let us look at things that are happening, you know, as researchers to try to understand human behaviors, right? We can look through this window of the data and think, oh, I can learn something, right? And so systems can learn something about the things that we do online, and researchers can learn something about the things that we do online, but neither of them actually um, helps the people themselves who created these data normally. And that's what I'm really interested in, 
which is personal data as a mirror, helping me, not as a window, but helping me look back at the things I do to understand myself better. And whether it's data that I put out there in the course of doing other things, like Flickr and Facebook, or whether it's wearing special purpose capture tools, like the SenseCam that was developed at Microsoft by Gordon Bell and others, that takes a picture every 30 seconds, you know, everywhere you go. Or whether it's something like Fitbit that sort of tracks, you know, when you're being physically active and then you can upload that and think about, you know, the times of day and the places where you do things, right? These data can help us not just sort of model people, right, or build systems that take advantage of this knowledge to make recommendations or sell ads, but to help us understand ourselves, right? And so, so that's what most of this talk is going to be about. And in particular, it's going to be about a very specific kind of self-understanding that's a big problem for me personally, which is reminiscing and reflecting on the past. And in fact, if you look at a lot of people's research, you'll find that the problems that they work on actually are things that affect them or the people around them. And that's actually a really cool thing, right? Because then you're really motivated to work on it. And so I'm going to be talking about reminiscing in the system called Pensive, which is in fact related to the Harry Potter Pensive artifact in ways that will become apparent soon. And uh, we'll talk about this as a case of helping people understand themselves, right? We'll talk about some of the forces that shape the data that these systems can use, and we'll talk a little bit about design ideas for sort of managing those forces, social forces, forces, you know, about impression management, forces about the face that we put on for others, forces about, you know, our relationships that sort of make things more or less interesting or appropriate or comfortable to talk about online, right? And then maybe if we have time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, more targeted applications that try to uh, make people healthier and happier um, physically and mentally. All right, so that's the goal. Um, other thing about this talk, if you have questions at any time, feel free to throw them in. There will be a explicit pause for questions in about 15, 18 minutes when we first finish talking about Pensive. But if you have questions along the way, just throw them out there, OK? All right. So <clears throat> why reminiscing? Why did I care about this so much? So I, I, my ex-wife, um, made a lot of fun of me during the 17 years because I just didn't remember things at all. I didn't remember the past, right? And I especially didn't remember good things about the past. I seem to have a talent for remembering embarrassing moments. But many of the good things that happened to me just sort of slip away, right? And I almost never take time to think about them by myself, either the good ones or the bad ones, because you know people are busy and you've got other things in your life. But it turns out that this reminiscing is actually really important, right? People in psychology have studied reminiscing. It plays huge, valuable functions in terms of things like helping you sort of manage today's problems by sort of applying lessons from your past, right? It helps you come to grips with the person you were before who is not necessarily a very good person, right? Bad things happen to you. You do bad things. And reminiscing is one of the ways that we sort of manage and come to understand these things about ourselves. Reminiscing is a social activity for a lot of people. I'm telling stories about my life and my past in part to help make social connections and get you interested in this talk. We reminisce with people to make friendships and we, remember, we reminisce about people um, when they're not around, right? Either because they're physically distant or they die or other, other reasons that people sort of fall out of our lives, right? And so this is actually something that although you think about old people on a park bench, right? In fact, everybody reminisces all the time, right? Now, if I asked you right now, when was the last time you reminisced, right? It, you might actually have trouble pulling that out of your brain, right? Because we did this in our first set of interview studies when we were trying to really understand what's going on with people remembering the past. And, and, and you know, people actually stop. They're like, oh, I, I, I don't know, right? But in fact, you know, it's kind of triggered all the time by a story, by a smell, by some piece of context that you see. And if you, you know, probably after this talk, as you're going through the rest of your day, you'll, know, you'll be more likely to notice it, right? So take a minute to kind of notice the role that it's playing in your life. Um, for me, like I said, in general, I didn't 
spend much time remembering the past. And because Sue, the ex-wife, made fun of me, I started keeping a diary of all the things that happened to me. Right? This is back in like 98 is when I started it. And so here, as you can see, it's kind of kind of some of the bad things, right? I mean, this guy who I had a big our fight with, my sister thrusting her diploma in my face at her graduation. Now, it turns out, right, at the time I was just angry. But it turns out that my sister is three years younger than me. And so in school, right, she always got the, oh, or you're Danny's sister thing, right, that siblings often get when an older sibling comes through, right, because I was the smart kid, and so people were like, oh, you're Danny's sister, right, and she always was kind of annoyed by that and the fact that she was behind, but she actually got her master's degree before I did, right, her life kind of took her straight to that, and so she was really proud, right, and so, so thinking about this, right, at the time I was just angry, Right? But, but, but thinking about this now really kind of helps me understand better this relationship. Right? Now, the weird thing is that if it weren't for this talk right now, I probably would not have looked at that. Right? Because like every other piece of social media, the old stuff goes away. And in fact, I never read this thing myself. Right? I read it exactly once a year when I took the file name and I changed it to Diary 1998 and cleared it out so I could start 1999, right? And so I almost never looked at these data. And if you think about your own data in social media, you know, you probably have non-trivial amounts of Flickr. You have a bunch of photos. Right? Even on your phone, you probably have a bunch of photos. And my guess is you don't flip through them all that often, right? But they're there. They're waiting for you. And my insight was that, well, we do have all this stuff, and further, that computers could read it for us, right? That it could, the computer could sort of take this stuff, aggregate it, process it, parse it. And then because reminiscing is usually spontaneous, what I told my computer to do was start sending me text messages with little snippets of my past from years ago, right? So, you know, I was... Um, I, you know, I, I started doing the, I did the prototype for this system in like 2008. Um, and, um, and, 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 you know, so I was getting stuff from three, five, ten years ago, right? The very first message it sent me was the thing I wrote on September 11th, 2001, right? So not all of these memory pieces that it sends are good, right? That was bad. This one is not very good either. This was me at the end of an internship. Right? Oh, wow, this internship was actually a really cool opportunity, but by the end of it, I'm sitting in this restaurant in the middle of nowhere in New Jersey, like, God, I just want to go home, right? You know, you had this kind of fatigue. Right? And thinking about what an internship was like. Well, so anyway, so, so, so the, you know, the reminiscing, right, it would spark me four or five times a day to think about these elements of myself that otherwise I might have sort of lost. Right? And I showed this to people, and they said, well, that's pretty interesting. We have this stuff, too. And I got a team of undergrads at Cornell interested in the project. And they, um, they, they said, let's design a system that other people can use that doesn't just work with your blog. Right? And so the big design question right up front was, what should the system be like? Right? And, and, and we're not the first people to talk about reminiscing in HCI. Uh, this, uh, this guy on the left is called the, the FM radio, the family memories radio. Right? And what it would do is it would record. They took an old radio and repurposed it to record sounds that happened around the house and then invited people to experience those sounds later, sound being a pretty powerful trigger for reminiscing. Right? You hear that song that you and your boyfriend danced to at the prom, and you know it's our song and it brings back lots of memories. And so that was, that, so, that's, so that's cool, right? Or this guy here is called the, the, the Living Memory Box. It was developed at uh, Georgia Tech back in 2003. And the idea was that you would put some tchotchke that you got on your trip to Paris, right, um, into there, and it would scan it, and then you would record a little bit of video about it, right, so that there was some context, so that when you croaked, your kids would find this Eiffel Tower statue, and they'd be like, what, is, what meaning does that have? And they'd put it in the box and be like, oh, yeah, Paris, that's where we had Bobby, right? And so you'd find out something that you might not want to think about about your parents exactly. But the idea was that you, know, you could attach context to physical objects, right? That would then make them sort of more memorable and useful for other people later. And, and these are cool, right? These are cool systems. But they're systems that are like special 
purpose, right? You have to, if you're gonna go play with the digital memory box, you, or the living memory box, you really have to go use this tool, right? And, 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 and some reminiscing is actually very special in this way, right? The photo album, right? Grandpa pulls out the photo album and shows it to kids, right? Or grandpa pulls out, you know, the eight, you know, the 35 millimeter projector and shows some home videos of his grandpa from 1942, right? As kind of, and sometimes these tools are appropriate. But because of reminiscing's importance, because of the fact that it's often spontaneous, because it's something that we just sort of do as part of our, our, our gig of being human. Um, what we were inspired by was this idea of everyday computing that came out of Georgia Tech. The idea that there are certain things that we want to do, they're not tasks that we're trying to finish, right? They're things that are woven throughout our lives, right? Like monitoring the awareness of your friends on Facebook. That's not a task, that's everyday computing, right? And we saw reminiscing in this way, and so our designs had to fit existing practices and uses. They had to be things that people do in context they already do them, right? Because if you ask people to do something new, hey, design, you know, use this new crazy tool that you've never used before, chances are it's not gonna work very well because why should they bother learning it? Why should they invest the time, right? We wanted to use existing media and content for the same reason. A, it reduces cost. B, it has stuff that is actually useful for the task of reminiscing, right? Because not, although not everything you put on Twitter is meaningful, a lot of it is, right? More so than like the average picture that the sense cam would take, right? You're actually being selective about what, what is important to you when you put it into social media. Um, the undergrads I was working with really hated the text messages for exactly the reasons that I love them. And the reason they hated it was because apparently Young people, this pains me to say this because this means I'm old people, but, but you know, if they get a notification on their phone, find it very hard not to look at their phone and play with their phone and text someone on their phone, right? This is happening in the audience even as we speak, and, and, and which is cool, right? But they didn't want to be forced to reminisce, and they talked about situations like, suppose I'm in a job interview and one of these things comes up, right? And I see something about my dead dog fluffy and I cry during the job interview. I actually think that would increase your chances of getting the job interview. Well, maybe not pulling out your phone in the middle of an interview. But, 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 but they wanted more control, right? But we still wanted it to be something that people would just engage with as part of their 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 day-to-day -day life and at unpredictable times. And then finally, everybody we interviewed said, man, I wish I had more of this stuff to think about and reflect on. And so the design, our goal was to try to encourage people once they started reminiscing, to, to make it really easy for them to sort of record thoughts or reflections or other things that they might want to reminisce on later. Right? And so we went through some prototypes, we did some iterating. Even the name was up in the air for a while. Some people liked Pensieve, some people liked Flashback, right? I mean, flashback's a little weird because it's got that LSD connotation and it also makes me think of like Back to the Future, but and, and eventually Pensive won. And it turns out that Pensive, right? I mean, you guys are actually going to laugh when you see Pensive. Um, Pensive, the technological artifact, is not hard. Pensive, the technological artifact, is, is something that any senior could build. Because, and I, we know this because a bunch of seniors built it, right? It's a website that you sign into, create an account, and then tell it about social media where you have information that might be useful for you to reminisce about. Not any social medium. We didn't want to store passwords. OAuth wasn't as popular at this time. So we wound up picking only public things, right? Flickr, Picasa, Blogger, Twitter, Last.fm. Last.fm because it's got these sounds and sounds are actually pretty interesting for reminiscing about, right? And also these were the systems that the undergrads who were working on the project had a lot of their data in, right? So it was very sort of self-centered, self-driven research, right? Um, and so you would go to Pensive and for many people this was the last time they would ever see the website, right? You could go back to the website for other things. You could control how often you got the triggers. By default we sent them once a day. Uh, you could make it multiple times a day. You you could do it like once a week, right? So you could sort of tune it to, to your level of desire and need for reminiscing. But mostly the way people interacted through email, and this is the compromise, the spontaneity control compromise, is through email. 
And so what Pensive would do is it would wake up every once in a while as a cron job on some web hosting service. And it would go through everybody and say, hey, is it time for uh, a, a memory trigger? And if it was, it would randomly pick one of the services that you would put in there or one special service, oops, one special service that uh, we put in, because not everybody uses social media for these things. And so we also created some of these non personalized prompts, right? Prompts that were derived from this idea called reminiscence therapy from the literature, where in care homes, like a, ca a caregiver would have a conversation with a group of residents and say, hey, think about this moment in your lives. And this is not data that's specific to you, but most of you can probably think of the best concert that you ever went to. Or, you know, like me, I, I've never been to a concert, right? Uh, so for me, that this was actually not very useful, but, you know, for many of these prompts, right, remember learning to cook. Uh, remember a fall day where you grew up, right? What was your favorite pair of sunglasses, right? Things that, that although not necessarily tuned to you, could be pretty evocative for things that had happened in your life. Um, it would also, you know, so I, I mostly got these. Um, this guy here is John Baxter. He's actually one of the lead develop, undergrad developers on the project, living out his Star Wars fantasies um, on, on uh, Picasso, right? He's not quite Star Wars kid in this picture, but close. And, um, and, 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 and you would get these emails, and you had no particular task, right? Like, eh, reminisce or don't. Think about it or not, do it now or later, right? Because our goal wasn't to try to structure people's reminiscing or change it. It was just to make it sort of salient in their lives a little more than it otherwise would be. Um, the one other feature that Pensive did have was a diary, right? So we conceived of this not as a social reminiscing tool, right, which most HCI research focuses on, helping people reminisce together, supporting families, but as an individual reminiscing tool, right, aimed at helping you sort of think about yourself. And so this diary metaphor becomes really appropriate for that. This is where I write my private thoughts about these data that I put into social media, right? Because as we'll see, you know, in social media, you have this kind of positivity bias. Here's a space where you could tell, you know, the backstory that you're not willing to put on stage in front of other folks. Um, and the really sort of, one really um, awesome thing about this is that one of the, the other lead developers on the project, Brian Olson, was like, boy, wouldn't it be cool, right, if you really believe in this idea of, of embedding this in people's daily activities, maybe people should be able to write diary entries by just replying to the email, right? Now, if you're like a designer trying to drive traffic to your site, you're like, God, what an awful decision, right? Because that means they'll never visit your site. But in fact, by putting it right at the moment when they were reminiscing about the data that they were sent, and by making it unbelievably easy to write diary entries that way, that's how we got almost all of the responses that we got from Pensive, right? There were a few people who would go to their diary once every few weeks and go through a whole bunch of things and write, but most of the responses were because we sort of really integrated it into the process. We didn't make it special. We made it normal. Right, that's what we were designing for. And so we threw this out into the world. Um, we made it publicly available. We uh, spread the word, right? So if you look at the demographics, right? The female male one is interesting because women on average are shown to value reminiscing more. And so it kind of makes sense that that's how it broke down. Um, the age group one, you can guess how that happened, right? A, Younger people have more stuff on social media. B, the research team from which the advertising started were undergrads, right? And so we tended to have more younger people, although a non-trivial number of people, of old people like myself who used it. Um, about 11,000 prompts went out. Most of them were this non-personalized stuff. It turns out that only some people were interested in and willing to put their personal content out there for a system to look at, in part because of privacy concerns, in part because they weren't sure what we would do with the data, right? But, you know, on balance, people wound up using it a fair amount. Most people didn't turn it off, didn't unsubscribe. There was a reasonable number of diary entries, right? About uh, one in 15 prompts got a diary entry, right? Which is actually a non-trivial response rate for random emails that come all the time, right? Um, and then we also, um, so we analyzed this stuff, we analyzed the behavior, and we analyzed some re questionnaire responses that we got to try to understand 
what, if anything, Pensive was doing for two people. Uh, Tejas and Victoria were the grad students who were in the lead on the project at this time. And the basic answer is that, I mean, it, it, it worked. I mean, it, it just worked, right? That people got the triggers. If they were ready for them, they reminisced. If not, they put it off till a later time. Sometimes they ignored them when their life was too busy. But on balance, they really said, yeah, you know, I don't need to write, right? Not everybody wrote a lot, but even the ones who weren't writing, right, were using the triggers to sort of reflect on themselves, right? Exactly what we were aiming for. And it's, it's important to think about this because in the, in the first version of this paper, right, in the first version of the Kai paper, we talked about, you know, analyzing, reminiscing, right, when we were really talking about analyzing the stuff that people wrote, right? The reminiscing was going on in their heads, right? Not all the important things that happen in the system that you build are the visible things that you can see, right? So for instance, if you are building tools for health, right? Suppose that you're building a tool to help people eat healthier or reduce smoking, right? Eventually, you don't want them using your, your system, right? You don't want to someone to have to wear the nicotine patch for the rest of their lives, right? And so thinking about whether you really need the behavior in your system to show victory, right? Or whether you can just ask people, oh yes, this actually worked, and even though you can't see it, it's actually important and there, right? It's something we tend to forget as designers, right? We tend to log and we tend to rely on the logs because that's what we can see and what we can manipulate. But a lot of the important stuff is invisible. Um, further, what happened with the, um, with, the, with the system, right, was not so different from what really happens in reminiscing. People used it to think about themselves. They used it to maintain social relationships, right? We weren't trying to change the process. We weren't trying to change people's values. We weren't trying to change the goals, right? We were trying to just make it a little easier, a little more salient. And basically, it was, it was total, in this sense, it was pretty much total victory, right? These are broad sentiments from the people who were posting things, uh, both in the triggers and the questionnaires. Now, it's not perfect, right? Not everything's meaningful. This one person kept getting a picture. They had like a photo album that just had a picture of a mushroom on a rock, and the, the random algorithm that chose which content to show, for some reason, picked this one a lot. And they're like, wow, Pensive kind of sucks. It shows me pictures of mushrooms, right? And you would like, probably, to figure out what's more or less meaningful to people and try to send the more meaningful stuff, right? Um, People also talked about this idea that not everything that comes out of your past is good, right? Now it turns out that there's a whole subfield of uh, psychology around, or psychotherapy, or around cognitive-based therapies that try to get you to sort of think about, you know, sort of train the way that you think about things. And one of the common techniques they use is taking past events and then reflecting on them. This guy, Jamie Pennebaker at uh, UT Austin, developed something called the expressive writing paradigm, where we just ask people to write about traumatic incidents in their lives. Just write, no grading, no analysis, nothing. But that if you sort of measure before and afters, right, in terms of like psychological scales of well being, people get better. It helps them just to write about the past, right? And so even though Pensive did have the potential of triggering negative memories, right? Or for instance, for me, my ex-wife shows up in these things, right? For some people, that would be a really negative memory. For me, it's not, fortunately. Um, but, but, you know, on balance, people said, well, although it was sometimes uncomfortable, it was actually sort of important to do. Um, but it is something to think about, right? The sort of unintended or potential negative consequences of your crazy designs. And then the third thing that we saw was this idea that culture matters. That, um, you know, we had a bunch of rich white kids in the Northeast writing these prompts, right? And so when he said something about prom, right, people who aren't from the US are like, what? And, you know, although this is also kind of design 101, right? You should be aware that not everybody is identical and you should be sensitive to cultural contexts. You know, we got some really powerful feedback about that, right? That, that the ways that we sort of trigger this reminiscing and think about it, right? It's important to, to, to tune it to different purposes. And we'll talk about this personalization, actually, a little bit later. But um, 
you know, the, the, the high level bit, right, is, is this idea that reminiscing is actually something that's useful. Um, that social media content is a useful trigger for it. That, um, you know, Facebook did this, right? First with photo memories and then with time hop, or with uh, timeline. This company, Time Hop, right, that, that sends you reminders from, you know, one year ago today, things from your social media, right? These are things that are out in the world now, right? It's something that people care about, the value that they do. And so we'll talk about this a little bit more, but the question started, and this is actually where I normally pause for questions anyways. So let's have some questions. So uh, about two slides back, you said something about measuring success outside your mm -hmm. design system. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate a little bit on how you would measure that? Because self-report is notoriously in unreliable mm -hmm. when it comes to... So is log data, it turns out. Yeah, but... Yeah, is that right. You no, no, this is the point, right? No one data source is telling you everything, right? Not everything gets logged. Systems fail. Right? Not all of my personal behavior gets online. I self-censor, right? So that's also got some danger in it, right? And so thinking about what are the different ways that you can evaluate, right? I mean, yes, in some crazy, perfect in some, by some definitions world, right? I could sort of hook you up to stress sensors and I can measure your stress continuously over time, right? And I could give you this tool. And then I could say, well, if you use Pensive, right? Your average stress level is 0.26 gigajoules or whatever you're measuring stress level in, um, lower than if you didn't use the system, therefore it wins, right? But you can't necessarily do that either, right? The biggest point though is that, that you know, if we spend all and only our time on sort of behavior, right? Especially when one of the goals of the system is to encourage behaviors that aren't in the system, right? Reminiscing behavior is not in Pensive. Reminiscing behavior is here. Social media data is not memories. It's data that people use to remember. Right? And so you really have to think carefully about what it is you're trying to accomplish right? and what are the things that you can measure, however imperfectly, that get at it. Right? And whether it scales before and after, or it's you know, measuring stress, or it's qualitative interviews, they each tell you some piece of the story. Right? Yeah. About kind of differences in time scale and how you might design for practices of uh, reminiscing versus practices of gratitude. So, uh -huh. for example, when people um, are trying to practice gratitude, they may be practicing gratitude in the life that they're in right now, this kind of present moment. Mm -hmm. And also, other practices of gratitude, or for example, um, the practice of asking yourself what went well mm -hmm. and then saying, oh, you know, yesterday this went well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a couple of uh, pieces of that, right? So one is um, when you say gratitude and think about the, what went well, there's actually this other piece of cognitive psycho or of psychology, uh, positive psychology, right? And it's a group of people who said, let's not focus on just, you know, sort of, you know, clinically depressed people. Let's think about what people can do to improve their well-being across the entire spectrum, right? And so positive psychology is the name that goes by. And they actually have done a number of things in, they're similar in some ways to that Pennebaker expressive writing paradigm that we mentioned earlier. They ask you, to ask you to think, what are three good things that happened yesterday and why did they happen, right? They ask you to think about you know, somebody who you feel gratitude for from your past and write a letter to them and deliver it, right? And they have this set of interventions that one might use to, uh, you know, in a more structured way than pensive, right? to you know, organize the reminiscing in ways that have been shown, right? If my goal was to improve people's psychological well-being directly in ways that I can measure in scales and that ways that positive psychology had thought about, I would have done self, you know, I would have done sort of questionnaires before and after using sort of validated scales and I would have been very careful to study that, right? My goal was to prompt reminiscing, not necessarily to you know, improve well-being because it wasn't obvious to me that it would, right? But you could totally do that. Right? You could totally structure this. And in fact, Victoria Sosick, the student who we saw earlier on the slide, her dissertation is positive psychology. Right? 
with social media content to support it, right? To make it more interesting, to make it lower cost, to prompt more memories, to introduce variety, all of which the goal is to get people to do that practice for a longer time, to do three good things exercises for a month instead of a week, because on balance, the research shows that the longer you do it, the more benefit that you get, right? And so structuring it so that it's something that could happen over time, or, you know, like I was talking with Joy earlier, instead of focusing on one piece of content at a time, figuring out a way to tell a story across a set of content that you have. What is this? archive of data, or what is this album of pictures, or what are all the interactions I've had with you say about our relationship? Can I think about the relationship, not individual moments in it, right, is actually kind of a really promising extension to this kind of work. Hard for reasons we'll talk about in a little bit, I think, but promising. More questions? Right. Let's talk about some of the hard things then. All right. So um, Victoria and another student, Chen Zhao, uh, started looking at how people do this kind of memory work around data that is in Facebook. Instead of using Pensive itself as a system and focusing on individuals, they wanted to focus on kind of social processes. So they looked at friendships and romantic relationships and how people use these data to think about them, the bigger picture of them in the way that we were just talking about. And it turns out that you know there's something really weird going on, right? That if I show you a picture, if I show you this particular picture of Victoria and Lindsay, and and ask you to think about your relationship. It's really easy to think about that event, and it's really hard to think about the relationship. Because the data, by bringing in all these associations in your head about that particular moment in your relationship, gets you to think about this thing that happened, right? And it turns out that people, right, we learn patterns, right? Those crazy neural networks up in our heads sort of lead to kind of patterns and general understandings. But the way we tend to experience memories, right, is through these kind of individual moments, right? In fact, if I tell you, remember some time span, right? That's, I don't even know if we can do that. Why, right? We can remember pieces of it, and then we can tell ourselves stories about those pieces. But in fact, it's really hard to get people to think like scientists about themselves. Right? People are not trained to be scientists. They're tr not trained to interpret graphs. Right? So you see a lot of quantified self. Hey, if you just track all the food that you eat and then show you a big graph of your food eating over time, you'll be a better food eater. Well, maybe. But people are not so good at that. Right? We actually had some other students, a couple of undergrads, OJ and Tiffany, built this system called PyTime, where they collected people's phone records and their Gmail archives. And then they sort of segmented it out, kind of like that graph we saw earlier, by hour of the day, by day of the week, by month of the year. right? Because these cyclical patterns actually do matter. And they were hoping to get people to think about these patterns in their lives. right? So this is someone's email archive over the week. Here's Sunday. Here's Friday. Turns out Friday, less email. right? Everybody's off partying and doing things that aren't work. Um, and so you can get some really coarse insights to it. But, but what they really thought was that it was going to help people see these big structures and how their lives were organized. And it turns out that these are, you know, despite this very nice idea of a pie as kind of a unifying circular thing in the circle of life and circles of time and connoting clocks and all the cool visual design justifications they had for this idea, people actually couldn't use it until they noticed that there were some details associated with each of the time slices, right? People would sit and stare at this, and then they would see up top, right, for this slice, the sort of maximally improbable words compared to the rest of the corpus, right? So they were doing kind of the Amazon game, the TFIDF game, the, the naive based spam filter game, and they picked out the words that were most characteristic of this time region. And then people were like, Oh, OK. What's going on is that on, on, in November, my mom was sick, right? And so they started thinking about why they had these patterns. But again, in terms of these specific individual incidents, right, the ways that memories get triggered in our head associatively, one memory at a time. And so you know, putting that together and helping people see these patterns is actually a non-trivial challenge for reflection. Uh, people also didn't put lunch in their news feeds, 
right? Some people do. There have been studies. Uh, some folks at Rutgers did this a few years ago. They had this semi-famous paper about me-formers versus informers, people who talk about themselves in social media versus sharing uh, you know, sort of useful general purpose information. But in fact, most people don't put everything in their streams, partly because some of it is so mundane it's not worth noting. Imagine a Facebook friend who posted 29 times a day, right? I actually wrote a piece of software once uh, that let other people set my Facebook status, right? Because I thought that would be really interesting to see what the social implications of that were, right? What would people do if they were able to set my Facebook status? Well, I demoed this in a class. And everybody started setting my status, you know, saying Danco is going to give me a good grade and things like that, and, and which, is, which was cool. But it turned out that this was like the day after Facebook changed the way it represented its news feed, right? At one point, it would only show one post by a particular friend. Like the day after I, I threw this into the world, they changed their news feed so that it showed everything that you did if you weren't careful. And so I like inundated my friend's news feeds with all these posts from other people, right? And so most people don't put everything up there. And further, even if they they wanted to social norms, right? I get to say some non-normal things, or I get to talk about some negative things because I'm talking about reminiscing, and you know, sometimes reminiscing is difficult and painful, and so I'm talking about ex-wives and people dying and things like that. Normally, you wouldn't hear that in a talk, right? And normally on Facebook, you wouldn't be posting bad things, right? If you look at the language of, of social media, right? If you run it through kind of that same sentiment analysis tool that, that these colleagues of mine were using earlier, you'll find that the words that people use in social media are way happier than average. So much so that, you know, there are people have studied um, how reading other people's news feeds makes us feel inadequate and jealous, right? Because it looks like everybody's shiny, happy, successful people because they're filtering the negative and emphasizing the positive, right? And so if you wanted to build a system that helped people do sort of Pennebaker style stuff that would pull out these difficult moments, it would be harder because there's this positivity bias, right? And this positivity bias, right, these biases, right, don't just affect sort of reminiscing, right? They affect, and this goes back to the what can you learn from log data, right? The self self reports or log data, you know, when it, that that world happiness on Twitter graph, right? I put quotes around every single word. World, because not everybody uses it. Happiness, because it's like this weird definition that involves using words that have positive and negative emotions. And then Twitter, right? Because A, it was only a, 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 small, a relatively small slice of Twitter, even though 500, 500 million tweets, right? That's a lot of tweets. Still just a slice. Very short time period, right? Happiness might change in six months. Those tweets might have been about, you know, during a particularly happy or a particularly sad season, right? And so the data we see has these biases embedded in it. Um, and it has them for lots of reasons, right? In part because we have presentational concerns, right? Goffman talks about the front stage and the backstage, right? There are things you're willing to express in front of other people, and there are parts of yourself that you're not usually willing to express, right? That's part of what drives us positivity bias. The relationships that we're in can affect the things that, that we decide to disclose, right? I may want to talk about a relationship. My partner might not. I might want to make it widely publicized. Other people might want to make it private. My norm might be to sort of, you know, Emphasize that I'm in a relationship by posting lots of pictures of me and my sweetie, right? Both to say, wow, smart, nerdy kid finally got in a relationship. And also, right, and this was actually an explicit strategy people talked about in how they use Facebook. They would tag themselves with their romantic partners as kind of an ownership claim on that partner to tell the rest of the world, back off, ladies, he's mine. Right? And, 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 the, and these things really do shape sort of the world that we see online. And so does the fact that um, although, you know, at, at different times, and this is actually work that Neil Farr was played a major role in uh, while well, she was at Cornell last summer. Um, this idea, right, that we have this stage metaphor that we're sort of filtering in the moment to decide what's appropriate and inappropriate. Well, once we've done this filtering, right, the data starts fading into the past. And suddenly, instead of a stage, right, which is the Goffin metaphor, Bernie Hogan talks about it as an exhibition where the system controls the picture of who you are, right? On Facebook, your, your past is timeline. And you have very little control 
over how your past is represented on Facebook. Right? In principle, you can change privacy settings. Most people don't. In principle, you can delete things. Again, most people don't because you know, one other thing about social media is that it's not just for social, it's also for self. Right? That Facebook is actually a stage, and it's a museum, and it's a personal kind of archive, right? You know, people told a lot of stories when they were doing this about, yeah, that picture where my hair looks bad, but I'm with this friend, so I don't want it to be shown on Facebook, but I do want to have it for later because I remember the friend, right? In a, in a world of sort of radical transparency and system control, right, it becomes a lot harder to think about, well, how how can I make a space for myself inside of social media or inside of Facebook? And so there's all these pressures, right? There's pressures about what data can do, about what data is appropriate to put there, and about what people want to do with the data now and later and what it means that make this kind of a challenging problem, right? That whatever we see about ourselves online, whether it's systems or researchers or us ourselves, is this kind of imperfect reflection of, of who we are, right? So that's most of the talk. And so I'm gonna take another pause for questions. It's always really awkward as a teacher, right? Leave me pause for questions. 30 seconds feels like forever in a context like this. It does. If you ever wind up student teaching or running a section or something, right? Be careful because you'll like ask, does anybody have any questions? And you'll wait like two seconds. You're like, no, okay, good. And then you'll move on, right? And then there will be all these questions that you never get to answer. Yes? So I was just starting to think about like, the, so the, I mean, Facebook is this controlled system. And so, if I want to have some system for like, now going back to like reminiscing mm -hmm. for personal uses, maybe Facebook isn't the right thing. Uh -huh. But, and I'm, I'm just trying to think about how to phrase this because Facebook plays a, a really big role in the sense that like everybody's on there. And that's getting to be less true as teenagers decide that it's not the cool thing anymore. But like, at least certainly for my generation, right? It's going to be everybody's on there. So they bring everybody <coughs> together in a way that some personal tool wouldn't mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. Um, so I'm just like, think like it's just a hard balance maybe to like try to balance that like bringing people together to get that kind of social stuff, but also yeah. Well, there was certainly you know it's kind of like the convergence versus divergence argument. For a while, people thought maybe we'd carry around lots of special purpose gadgets until smartphones came out, and then smartphones were good enough at everything that we wanted to do. They were good enough cameras. They were good enough phones. They were good enough email devices, right? Um, we actually had this with Pensive. We tried to build a social version of it. Right? We tried to embed social features where people could share things that they had gotten to reminisce with their friends about. And it was a total spectacular, brutal failure. Right? For partly because Pensive had been established as four individuals. Right? The diary metaphor doesn't work if you're so, you know, nobody has group diaries. Think about how weird that would be. Um, but also because, like you said, the action is in Facebook. And right? so one of the answers right, is figuring out where to make spaces for these different needs and whether it's within the platform in pieces right could you have a Facebook application that's set on the side of it that would you know you could move things to and from you know Shen's idea was this idea that you have a, a drawer right where you can put content I mean you can set things. one of the problems with the Facebook design right is that you can set things private right but then there's no way to easily look at my private stuff, right? And so, but you could imagine doing a little more thoughtful design around Facebook that made it, you know, here's the, the Danco part of Facebook. I mean, someone actually has a hack for this in Google Plus, right? Where you make a circle and then you don't add anyone to it and you share stuff to that circle and now you have a private archive, right? But, you know, thinking sort of intentionally about these needs and how our systems do or don't, right? I think that's one of the big design questions around it. Yeah. I think one of the problems with the making things personal on like Timeline or Google Plus is that a lot of the content that has meaning to us is not owned by us. Mm -hmm. So like if it's a graduation picture, so one of your friends took it and put it online, then it might be really personal to you. But if that person deactivates their Facebook, you're just losing it. Right. Will Odom is a researcher at Carnegie Mellon who's also interested in this general space of things. He's got this idea he calls 
virtual possessions, right? The idea that we have this digital content that has meaning to us, but that it's in the cloud, that often other people control it, right? And that this makes things even more complicated for thinking about how we manage these archives, right? And, you know, whether the answer is copies or replication or writes, you know, like imagine your Unix file system, right? Where you can have multiple links to the same file and you can delete your link and the file's still there for me, right? Whether there's a, some notion of multiple ownership that's like the right way to handle you know uh, online data it's unclear right but it is true right a lot of the things that that are special to us right are things that other people create and attach us to right photos with me and you together that someone else has right and it's actually really awkward people talked about this in the paper where you know you would get and one of the ways they dealt with this bad hair picture problem is that you know someone would tag you in the picture and you wouldn't approve it but you wouldn't deny it either you would just leave it in limbo right so that you would see it and this is actually one of the places I think in Facebook right there's this place for things that need approval right so that's actually it also has this nice side effect of carving out a private space to look at these things that you want for you but for nobody else right or people talked about this with relationship statuses um, in Facebook turns out that if you set the privacy settings of your relationship status right you can actually manage tensions between nerdo boys need to know that you're willing to put your relationship out there publicly and your desire not to sort of spam your friends with relationship things and so this this woman actually you know set set in a relationship and then made that visible only to her boyfriend right to try to negotiate some of these forces right she was using or like the google plus hack or like tagging and putting things into limbo right right now people want these things and they sort of force the interface to do it. And this is no surprise, right? People appropriate interfaces in ways that you don't expect all the time, right? It's not like Twitter was intended to be what Twitter is today, right? Twitter just kind of happened because people said, oh, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, right? But you might want to think about, well, can I design, right? Can I make a space for the relationship? Right? That is for not me, not you, right? with all the tensions around being visible to our different social networks. But this is the space in Renren, this is lover space, the space for us, right? where the content that's about us goes. Right? So I don't have to think, well, if I put it in my feed, I'm sending these certain signals or not sending these certain signals to my, relation, my, my network. I put it in the place for us. This is not my profile on Runner. I don't speak Chinese. I don't use the system. Um, nor is it Stan and Wendy's profile. That's just Shen's, uh, Shen, Shen and her talk for this. Use them as sort of indicators of the typical two people in a relationship. But, but this idea that you might design a place, a space for private, for relationships, a space to you know make meaning not just over one piece of content, but over many of them, right? A space to tell a story about a time in your life, a particular or visit a particular relationship, right? And then put things together that, that make these bigger meanings, right? It's kind of an interesting design question. Another one is to match up patterns in particulars, right? So Ben Schneiderman, right, of visualization, uh, information visualization fame, has this idea that you should be able to, when you show people big amounts of data, both look at overviews, big picture patterns, and then zoom in on details, right? And he just calls this overview and zoom. And in fact, one thing to think about, so this picture over here is activity data organized by day of week and time of day, right? This picture says something about this person, right? They exercise a couple of nights a week. They have some longer period of exercise. It's very regular on Sundays, right? And so it's uh, they exercise in the morning. And so this is this is one way of saying who I am as an exerciser, right? But there's another way to say it, which is to take the specific individual moments, right? The triathlons, the races that you ran. And so hooking up, you know, a lot of this, the work we do in computer science, right, we tend to think about graphs and aggregation and learning and sort of presenting people with conclusions that the systems designers or the systems themselves come up with. Pairing those interpretations up with the details that, that go in behind them so that people can do this kind of meaning making process 
probably a big win for thinking about helping people understand themselves, right? So if you're developing a persuasive computing technology, if you're developing a, you know, healthy eating technology, right? If you're developing something to encourage people to sleep more or an appropriate amount, right? Showing them not just the patterns, not just a raw dump of the data, but some, some representation that really helps them go back and forth between these things is probably going to be the win. Um, Especially a win if you can sort of capture important moments of context. One of the reasons time hop was so clever was that it was like, oh, one year ago today, right? Because the time of year is actually a kind of a salient memory cue for people. So are the people you are around. So are the things that you're talking about. So is the place that you did something, right? Place is a pretty powerful trigger. We prototyped in Google Maps, right? Hey, make a, make a memory map of, of your life, right? And people found these places. They used them in a lot of different ways, but they found this idea of place pretty compelling, right? And you could totally imagine a system that encouraged you, you know, going back to this everyday computing thing. Instead of sitting down in front of a computer and using Google Maps to record your memories, you'd be walking around campus. You'd be walking by your house, and you would hear a story, right? And that would be like a story about a student from five years ago, right, or someone who used to live in your house, right? Your phone would be running this app. The stories, the memories that people had left might become visible to you. You might then in turn leave some stories for the people that come behind you, right? So reminiscing and memory not just for individuals, but for groups or for cultures, right, using context as a way to do that, right? Time hops mobile now. It shouldn't just look at one year ago today. It should try to be smarter. Um, we talked about spaces for self, so so I'm actually going to wrap it up here because people seem a little energy today. I don't know if it's like midterms thing or I'm boring today or what, but 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 this this idea, right? This general idea that there's a lot out there about who we are, right? And that as designers, right, we have lots of options of things to do with these data, right? We can build models, we can build recommender systems, we can build graphs, we can build papers, we can build theories, right? But we can also sort of think about the things that we could build to help people more directly think about themselves or even to work together. So at uh, HCI launch, Stu was talking about why voice interfaces for like Google Glass don't work that well. His, his theory was that um, you know, there's a lot of the time, you know, there's no good way to sort of resolve ambiguities and ground the conversation. So the example was, I say I want to go to Alabama Street. It doesn't understand. It shows you a map of Alabama, right? No human being would do that. But a human being might not realize that you wanted Alabama Street either, right? But instead of making the sort of statistically most likely guess, right, what they would say is like, what do you mean? Right? And then there'd be this little conversation between the system and the person to sort of resolve these meanings, right? We tend to think, well, if we can just model it and solve the problem, right? If we can just get the one true perfect relevant search results where we don't have to ask the person anything to get the answer, right? But I think these worlds where we actually sort of yoke people and systems together to sort of solve the problem together, here the machine gives some suggestions. The person says, no, I don't like this. This I do like. Next time around, the system gives other suggestions for content to reflect on, or exercises to do, or meals to eat, right? These kind of designs that put sort of systems and researchers and people themselves together to make the meanings out of the data. I actually think that's kind of where the big win is going to be, right? And we all tend to see just a piece of the puzzle, because we only learn and are good at certain things, right? But the places where they come together are really cool places. So, so that's where I'll stop, and I'll take any more questions. And yeah. Sure. So one of the things that this last section you were talking about made me think of um, in terms of like the conversation is I really enjoy the NPR StoryCorps, mm -hmm. which is where they drive a van around to various places around the US and they have uh, people come in as duos or trios uh -huh. where one family member will interview another family member uh -huh. so that you're getting this kind of personal interaction between two very close people, but then you're recording it uh -huh. and that kind of becomes a story that other people can participate like, oh, this is a story from Alabama or this is a story from California. Mm -hmm. and you're, you know, you're interviewing your grandfather about the 50s or whatever mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so it seems like that's kind of, there's a personal connection there which makes that reminiscing really nice, which you maybe don't get when you're just emailing a computer, and the computer can't necessarily create that meaningful conversation for you in the way that it could right. between two people. So almost like, for me, like what I was kind of thinking about there is like, you know, yeah, the system wants to get this reminiscing to help you think about it in the future, but it leverages real people and real social contacts that kind of bring that story up. Yeah, and you know, I'm a little bit of a weirdo in how I reminisce, right? I really am kind of a solitary, not very social person by nature, and so I tend to think of reminiscing as a very sort of individual thing that goes on in my head. I know this isn't true for most people, and this is this is actually one of the interesting things from that Sea Friendship study, right? That we actually asked people, some people we didn't give them any Facebook data to look at. We didn't let them see their C friendship page. We just had them talk with their friend, right? And it turns out that the, kind of the same thing happened, right? Just the same way that data kind of focused and limited the way that you would reminisce, so would talking with the other person, right? It would become just the stories, right? It would be storytelling, which is a certain kind of and value of reminiscing. But you know, if, if the again, if the goal is to sort of reflect on the bigger pattern, it doesn't work so much, right? So, so different structures for it, right? I think thinking about what you're trying to get at and what you get out of having the conversation. Is it that it's interactive? It's, is it that it prompts pieces of memory to that, 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 that wouldn't have otherwise come up? At uh, San Diego yesterday, I was talking with someone who's doing research around um, helping parents of ADHD kids, right? There's, there's things you can do to help your kid out, right? When they, they, they sort of go through episodes, right? I don't know this very well, so I'm, I'm relaying right here, right? But basically, they train parents to sort of do behavioral interventions. The problem, <clears throat> right, is that when your kids going off the rails a little bit, right, it's really easy to get flustered and frustrated yourself and forget what the intervention is or that you need to apply it or to have the level of control right, to be able to apply it in that context. And so this, the research group, right, the idea is, well, let's, let's stress monitor parents. Let's try to build models of stress levels that let us predict when one of these peaks are going to come up. And then let's send reminders about these strategies and the needs to apply them, right? And so this is really cool, except the system usually got it too late, right? The system usually couldn't model, and this is something else we do in computer science all the time. We, we predict elections on Twitter by modeling using all the data available to us, whether, you know, some features that we can measure, right, from that particular election turn out to be predictive of whether someone won, right? And this model is totally useless the next election because you used all the data, right? And even if you were more careful about it, you don't really want to predict the data from everything. You want to predict like using the first 5% of your data, right? Hey, what's going to happen? Is this person going to be a valuable member of this community? Is this parent going to be stressed out? Is this innovation going to spread through the network by looking early on, right? And so one thing, and the reason why I bring this up with your question, is because really there's actually an early warning sign here too, right? The place where these people probably should put at least some of their sensors, right, if it's a parent and a kid, and if a parent gets stressed out because of their kid's behavior, Right? At least some of the sensing and modeling should be on the kid, right? Because the kid starts having this stress and starts exhibiting these systems before, right? And so if you really think about you know, building the system, this interact, you know, not exactly the same kind of interaction, but the idea that there's this other important element to it that you could sort of build in from the social interactions, right? If you sort of notice the things that were going on around me, right? If you notice that other people around me were starting to get too busy and not getting enough sleep, right? Maybe you could warn me before I got to, you know, all-nighter mission critical, totally, you know, stressed out mode, right? As soon as you start seeing it by the people around me, by my kids, by your parents, and then leveraging these other signals that people give you to, to go after your, your problems, right? So, so, you know, this idea of stress signaling, not directly related to the reminiscence, but this idea of thinking about, well, what can the social interaction actually give you, right? People do this in health applications, too. They're like, well, we got this social application, we got this application for, like, behavior 
behavior support or goal tracking or losing weight. Let's add some social stuff so people can talk and it'll just magically work better, right? Well, maybe, right? But if you sort of really think a little carefully about how you structure that social interaction, I think you're gonna get, get sort of better results, right? Why is it that being able to look at somebody else's strategies for eating or weight loss, why is that gonna help you, right? So there was a, a story, so there's a, a system by Andrea Grimes, Andrea Grimes Parker, a couple of years ago uh, from Georgia Tech, where she was looking at trying to get low income African Americans in Atlanta to eat better, right? And she added a social element there, and the social element was storytelling about food through cell phones, which were kind of a dominant platform, but voice, because you know people in the community actually valued the oral communication style more than like if you could look these things up in a database. And so by sort of leveraging that social community. So this is, I know this is an incredibly long-winded answer, but this idea of really thinking about you know, what it is social or the, the, the interactions that you're trying to capture are gonna do for your goals, right? That's kind, of, that's kind of the story I would tell when I was thinking, should I have conversations or should it be a group or should it be an individual? Should it be a lot of content or a little? How much context should I use? Yeah. Um, I was just curious if you have any thoughts um, I don't want to just go down the stereotypical privacy hole with the asking these questions, but uh, I mean, you, you have these things which are drafting onto uh, existing systems like Facebook or email, and there's a big difference between, say, email as a federated system versus Facebook being centralized and very personal data. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about how to. So how, what, how we might mediate or structure that in a way which mediate or structure a little bit less uh, weirded out or leads to less of like a lot of these problems come because you just pile <coughs> the data together without any restrictions on it and people okay. don't understand what they're sharing into the system or what the implications okay. of that are. And, yeah, so, I got, so okay, so I've got uh, several thoughts about this. One is that Helen Nissenbaum is a person who really articulated this well, right? That this idea that privacy and data, right? The real problems happen when data moves into a context that you didn't expect, right? It's all cool if you know that you've told Pensive that face that you can look at the Facebook data, right? It's all cool if you know you understand the privacy settings on Facebook and what the implications are for, right? Most people don't though, right? And so when you find out that a friend of a friend can look at your stuff, if a friend comments on it, right, it becomes very confusing and awkward to you, right? Because that's not what you expect. So part of the answer, right, is is helping people better understand the implications, right? Making it more salient, right? Whether it's making privacy controls more salient, or I saw this really cool poster a few years ago where someone analyzed company privacy policies and then looked whether the interfaces actually had features for helping you enact them, right? Turns out usually not so much, but kind of a really interesting thing to think about. But it also, right, might, you know, the privacy stuff or the sensitivity stuff, I'm working with someone who's really interested in how and why people disclose information in broadcast media like status updates in Facebook, right? Sometimes people do this in a not very self-aware way, right? And sometimes they become aware of it later Later, right, and then they regret it, right? That's a, a line of work that's being done largely at Carnegie Mellon right now about regrets in social media that's kind of interesting. Why do they happen? How do they repair them? And things like this. But, you know, interfaces could do a job of helping people understand, hmm, I'm disclosing something very personal right now. Are you sure that you want to put this out there right now, right? Give you a tool, you know, maybe compare it to your past behavior or to your friend's behavior. Maybe you could set up, you know, sort of warnings to yourself, right? So maybe instead of the computer making decisions about it, you'd say, hey, anything that looks, you know, that like I'm above stress level, you know, over 9,000 or whatever, you need to tell me, you know, Wait, right, wait for a little while. Or maybe the system could make really salient audience, right? So Michael Bernstein here, right, did some work with, with his peeps at Facebook about how people are not really very good at estimating who 
their audiences are in social media. And in fact, the, I don't know if he's given this talk here, but it turns out people are usually two to four times under how many people are likely to see any particular Facebook post, right? And so helping people see, oh look, this data right now is gonna go to many more people than you think, and here's who they probably are, right? Because you could probably reverse engineer a lot of the Facebook news feed if you really wanted to. Um, and then when you think, oh, that, or you know, what would be really cool, right, is sort of showing the future, right? What does the future of your data look like? And the first place I saw this context was like trying to protect yourself against making commitments in the future that you would later regret, right? We all as academics have this way of saying, oh yeah, I'll go do this talk, I'll be on this program committee, and the interface, you know, my calendar interface, my to-do interface doesn't sort of show me that in the future I'll be flying into San Francisco at 1142 at night and waiting for the shuttle, right? Um, and so, and, 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 you know, I would have come here anyways, but it would have been cool for the interface to have sort of made the consequences more salient. And I think that's a big picture on the personal side, right? So giving me more understanding and control of what's going on to the data, right? And then there's kind of sort of a legal, moral, social side that people like Victor Meyer Schoenberger has talked more about, this idea that data should go away because, you know, it presents a past version of us and it doesn't really represent who we are and that it's going to affect us in negative ways down the road. But I don't know, that's kind of that's kind of what I think about this, right? Helping people better understand the implications and giving them tools for thinking about it. And then sort of thinking at kind of the legal, social, right? I mean, the problem with this is that anything that, that's like this, you know, you suddenly have digital rights management, and it's probably not going to work much better for individuals than it has worked for companies, which is only but so good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the Renron example that you showed me, uh, it, it's really interesting, but I, I somehow think that it's a special case for n equal to two, <coughs> right? And we've got this sort of general case: how do you build a social experience for n equal to one, right? Where you have the Facebook and the Twitter, so yeah, so social integration. Okay, okay. So you ask two things: one is about different media, and one is about different group sizes. Just now, I think I'm more interested in the group sizes. Okay. Uh, so how how do you think we? We could come up with a theory for n equal to whatever number, uh -huh. right? So, well, I mean, unfortunately, I think this is actually going to be just brutally hard, right? If you think about, I mean, this in some ways, you know, if you if you want to go technical side, right? Think about the problem of maintaining a group memory and also who has, you know, going back to this question, who has the rights to look at that memory, right? Is essentially, it's pretty similar to the problem of access control lists in, you know, security, right? And this question of managing who can and can and should and shouldn't see the data is like, so that's one problem with the, the group. I actually think, though, that this idea of, um, yeah, I, 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 th I, I think you're right that, that, you know, one of the things about n equals two is that the negotiations, right, and the number of stakeholders and who gets to put the data out there is small, right? Who gets to say what the official history of my sorority or the HCI seminar or the synchronized skating club is, right? You do want to have these, or or of, you know, gosh, let's, let's scale it up a little bit, right? This guy, Maurice Malvena, you know, what's the official who gets to really put the things in and control the archive of stories from Irish people talking about the troubles in Ireland, right? Or what's the official story of, you know, the, the, the Somali move to Minneapolis, right? Or the Hmong community in California, right? Who, who gets to say those things? That's a hard question. I mean, I think this kind of, this aspect of sort of reminiscing and memory for, for large groups and cultures is actually really fun. It's not where I go because that's not how I'm wired, right? But people like Phoebe Sangers, people like Sophia Lau, right? They're thinking, you know, sort of hard about the, the, the N equals larger problem. I think the practical thing is that some people become representatives, right? That in practice, some people write the history books. In families, right, there's one or two people who are the memory keepers, right? They're that person who, you know, gathers the tapes, makes the scrapbooks, remembers the details, and tells the stories, right? Or in Facebook, more prosaically, you have a couple people in your network who are probably willing to go around and tag everybody in all the pictures. And actually, there's a ton of benefit to that, right? Because a few people who are willing to do the work for the community actually benefit a lot of it, right? And so the question would be, how can you leverage the fact that this is kind of a natural thing to do and that you probably 
most people don't want to be involved on a day-to-day -day basis with the risks that you're sort of, you know, you run into unresolvable conflicts like, you know, the U.S. government or something. So, yeah, so if, if this ends at 205 officially, we're done, I think. So uh, let's be done, but I'll hang out here for a little bit for questions and stuff.